At the end of my freshman year of high school, uh, we moved houses. And as a result, we changed high schools my sophomore year of high school. So I walked into the first day at a new school as a sophomore, not really knowing anybody whatsoever. Uh, that's a problem already for me. Uh, but then I walked into my second hour weightlifting class, and we were told to find a group of two or three people that you're going to spend the rest of the year with. Now I have a new problem. So I kind of waited and watched as everybody got with their friends and they partnered up with the people they wanted to be with. And then I looked for who do I think I can jump in with? Because I knew nobody. And there were a couple guys standing at the back of the weight room. And I went, maybe, maybe this will work out. I go up to them. I, I talk to them and say, hey, I don't know anybody. Can I join your group? They let me in kind of reluctantly. They were good buddies. Uh, they let me in and we, we hit it off pretty well. I ended up actually sitting at their lunch table because we shared that lunch hour together uh, with probably seven or eight other freshmen. They were all a year younger than me. So I am a sophomore in a new school. I only have friends that are freshmen, nobody in my grade uh, when I'm first starting out here. And I got really close to them. And as the years went on in high school, we, we drifted apart. Uh, or our classes that we had together became less and less. We stopped having lunch together at the same time. And I made other friends uh, that were in my grades. Uh, but I got really close to those two guys in particular, uh, spending that whole year with them, joking, lifting weights, and all those things. Well, one of those boys' names was Bryce. And it was Bryce's dream to go to West Point for college. That's what he wanted to do. And so he, he worked. He was probably one of the hardest workers academically. I knew he worked very hard to make sure his grades were great. Uh, he worked hard at his weightlifting. He worked hard in debate and all of these other activities that he was involved in. He wanted to do the best that he could so that he could get into West Point. Well, his senior year, he finds out he's going to be able to go. And then something happened at home where he and his mom, it was just the two of them living together, he and his mom got into some argument to the point where his mom felt threatened enough to call the police on Bryce. And while nothing developed from that uh, with the police, he now had something on his record. And this ability to go to West Point was pulled from him. He worked his whole high school even late of middle school, that's, that's all he wanted to do was go to this school. And he was in and then lost it all. Everything he worked for was taken away. He was hopeless. And not that long after he found out that he wasn't going to be able to go to that school, he decided to take his own life. And the reason that uh, we, we know everything that happened that led up to this point is uh, his mother shared that with everybody at school. He had a lot of friends at that school, uh, including myself, who at this point was a year out and had lost a lot of touch with him, but it's hopeless. He was one of five students I went to high school with uh, that took their own life during the course of that time. He was hopeless. He was not alone. The world's a very hopeless place. Uh, there are people that you come into contact with every day that also feel quite hopeless. Uh, and it doesn't have to be staring down the thought of suicide to mean that you're hopeless. It can be a lot of other things that cause you to feel hopeless. Uh, you can feel hopeless just in the normal course of life with things as they come up and it can cause you maybe not to feel as Bryce did that I need to take my own life but that, you know, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to make it through today. And that same feeling, it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if some of us right now, uh, even though we are dressed up and we, we look happy, if maybe on the inside some of us are feeling hopeless, it wouldn't surprise me today. It's a problem for everybody. What I want to talk about today and over the next few Sunday mornings is how we can overcome that hopelessness. Because while the world is a hopeless place, God does not want us to stay there. And He provides a way out of that hopelessness. Uh, he provides what we're going to call a way, a way to be hope-filled. 
If hopelessness is the absence of anything to look forward to, of, of something better in the future, then being hope-filled is the knowledge that you know right now that there is something that belongs to you, place that you're going, uh, something that you are going to take hold of someday, and because of that, you can keep pushing through the things that seem horrible to deal with. As we go through this series, we're going to focus in on the people of Israel in the book of Joshua. And if you have your Bible with you, I hope you do. Joshua chapter 1. So I'm going to ask you to turn this morning. I want us to look at the people of Israel over the course of these few lessons and how they went from hopeless people to hope-filled people. Before we read out of Joshua 1, I want to read these things to you. Uh, Starting here in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and Joshua chapter 1, the people of Israel find themselves in, a, in the same spot, just 40 years difference of time. In Joshua 1, the people of Israel are standing at the entrance to the promised land. The same thing is true of Deuteronomy chapter 1. Israel is standing at the entrance to the promised land. They go and send spies out. This is the land that God says, I'm going to give this to you. It belongs to you. It's yours. And they're waiting to go in. They send spies, 12 total, one from each tribe to go look at the land. And the spies go and they say, the Lord is bringing us to something great. But then, they come back and they have this to say, our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. If we were to continue on into verse 29, uh, you would have the Lord saying, do not fear, do not be dismayed, because they're full of fear and dread. They're looking into this nice land and they say, the land is good, but the Lord's brought us here to die. Because there are great, mighty, giant people guarding great, giant, mighty cities, and there's no way we're going to be able to overcome that. The people felt hopeless. In Numbers chapter 13, we read this. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. In talking about the giant cities and the giant people that are in those cities, the people of Israel can only say, we look like grasshoppers in their sight and in ours. Isn't that what hopelessness is? You look at the, the thing that is causing you all this grief, and maybe it's, maybe it's your financial situation, and you look at it and go, okay, there's this school debt I have to pay, there's uh, this, this debt I owe here, and I, I owe these other people, and you look at this giant thing in front of you and say, there's no way that I, being so small, can overcome this giant thing, and you feel hopeless. Or you look and say, I know God wants my marriage to look like this, but I'm not sure how it could ever get there because we have these, these differences here in, in personality and how we think and, and we, we grew up differently and our traditions are different. And so you're staring up at this giant thing and saying, it's never going to be what it's supposed to be. And you feel hopeless. Uh, this week we had our high school lunch and I asked, I asked the kids in there, what's the time you felt most exhausted? And the first two kids said, this week. You know, school is winding down. It was school. And so they're looking at, I've got senior year coming up ahead of me this next year, and I've got to figure out what I need to do, and I'm going to have to figure out where do I want to go to college, and I've got to get this work done and these tests prepared for, and they're looking up and going, I don't know how I'm supposed to deal with this giant thing in my life, and they feel hopeless. That's what hopelessness is. We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. What I want us to talk about today is the first step in overcoming this hopelessness and moving into becoming hope-filled. And this brings us to Joshua chapter 1. As we read Joshua 1, 1 through 9, you're going to notice a lot of phrases over and over again. Be strong and courageous. Some of the songs that we said today uh, talked about that idea. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle's his. Well, that that idea is repeated in the first nine verses of this book. Uh, There's a number of verses referring to the law and how they should care about the law and study the law and know the law. But I think it all comes down to 
what we see in verses 5 and verses 9. And that is that they need to understand that God is with them. And the first step to overcoming hopelessness is to understand that God is with you in those times of hopelessness. The trouble that Israel ran into as they stood at the entrance to the promised land was instead of thinking about the God that they serve that, as Deuteronomy 1 later on in the chapter will say, led them by pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He was before them. They lost sight of, the, of God and focused instead on the giant cities and the giant people. And when they looked at the giant cities and the giant people, they said, we're so small in comparison. And what they should have done was turned around and, and said, okay, but my God's bigger and mightier and greater than the giant things that we're seeing in this land. They lost sight of his presence. And it doesn't matter what the lessons following this say about how we can practically move forward out of hopelessness into being hope-filled. It doesn't matter if we don't get this part right. We have to know that God is with us if we're going to be filled with hope. Here is what I believe Joshua does, in, or the Lord is doing in Joshua chapter 1 to show them how they can be uh, aware of God's presence. We're going to start here in verses 3 through 5. First thing they need to do, the Lord tells Joshua, you need to trust in God and His Word. Let's read that together. Joshua 1 verses 3 through 5. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the go going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. In talking to him about God's presence with them, he tells them a couple things that I want to note here. The first is this. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. Uh, I didn't notice this until last night. This is a late edition, which means I had to kick some other things out because the sermon was a little long already. But I noticed, and I hope you notice this too, every place the sole of your foot will tread, it's not there yet because they're still standing at the entrance of the promised land, just like the generation before them in Deuteronomy 1. They still haven't gone in yet. But the Lord tells them, every place that your foot is going to go, I have given it to you. It's already yours. It belongs to them. Why should they not be hopeless in the face of these, these giant cities and these giant people? Why should they not be hopeless? Because they've already won. Because God's already given it to them. And every place that they're going to step throughout that promised land, God said, it's already yours before you even take the first step in there. Because you're not the ones doing it. I am. So they need to be filled with hope. He says this as well in verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Nobody can stop you from getting what I've told you I will provide. They need to be hope-filled and recognize that God is with them and already provided for them the victory. Here's the second part. They need to follow God's word. This is verses 6 and 7. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. He immediately follows this idea of you need to trust in me and trust in my word and what I said I will do for Moses. That's what I'm going to do for you. You need to trust that. And after you trust that, you need to follow those things. Be careful to do all according to the law. And don't turn to it from the right hand or the left. God is concerned with them doing exactly what they're supposed to in the best way that they can. Uh, if you trust me, you'll do what I say. That's what the Lord's telling him. And, and if you follow this, you are going to have great success wherever you go. If Israel is going to be aware of the presence of God in their lives, instead of the presence of the giant cities and people in the land that they're about to walk into, they need to trust God 
They need to follow God. And the third thing is they need to love God's word. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do, all, to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Uh, the word love is not used there at all, so why do I use the word love? It's because of the amount of time and places that the Bible, the, the law here is said to be needed where it's prevalent. The first thing that he says here is that it shall not depart from your mouth. The law needs to be something that the people of Israel are always talking about. Talking to each other, uh, telling other people about it. The law is what needs to constantly be on the lips of the people of Israel. And if they do that, then they are keeping God in their minds and remembering that God is with me doing what he said because they're repeating the words that he said. But then number two, shall meditate on it day and night. Now their thoughts all the time are consumed with thinking about God and his law. And if they're doing that, if they're talking about it to each other, to one another, and day and night they're thinking about it, uh, what does it mean? What does God want me to do with it? Uh, I trust that God means what he says. Now I'm going to follow those things. If they're doing that, then they're going to remember all the time that God is with them. And then the third thing here, that you may be careful to do. It, it goes from things that you say to think about the law to actually put this into practice. Don't just talk about it with each other. Don't just think about it on your own every night, but actually do these things. Show other people that God is with you. Do things that might scare you, like going into the promised land where the giants are because you know God is with you. Do something with it. And it's for those three reasons that I use the word love here because the, the law is supposed to consume every part of their life day and night talking and thinking and doing the law. And if they can do that and trust his, his word, follow his word, and love his word, they will never forget that God is with them. And it's because of that that verse 9 is true. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How are they supposed to be strong and courageous? How are they supposed to be filled with hope when they're staring down a very scary situation? By trusting, by following, by loving His law. And if they can do that, they'll remember the presence of God. Same thing is true for us. If we're going to overcome hopelessness, we have to realize that God is with us. I want us to do this together. Uh, if I were teaching a kid's class, I would say yell this. Probably don't do that. Uh, but do say this out loud. Uh, we'll count to three and then we'll say God is with me together. Can we do that? Are we all right with that? Are we awake? One person's awake, so this will be really good. Okay. God is with me on three. One, two, three. God is with me. And it's really easy to say that right now when you're prompted to say that. It's easy to say that when everything in our life is going exactly the way that we want it to go. Job's good. My family's going well. Uh, my, my children are obeying. My marriage has never been better. Uh, my job's going great. Everything's going like it's supposed to. I'm getting everything done the way I'm supposed to. It's easy to say the Lord is blessing me right now. But the Lord's blessing you when those things are not going the way that you want them to go. And the Lord is still there when it doesn't feel like he's there. And it's easy right now to say, God is with me. Well, he's with you then too. God was with Israel when they stood at the entrance of the promised land in Deuteronomy 1 and said, we can't take these giants down. And in my head, what I'm picturing is, here's Israel and they're standing there. They're looking up at these giants and saying, man, I feel like a grasshopper in their eyes and in my own eyes. And meanwhile, you have the Lord standing right next to them wanting to tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, I'm greater than those things are. I'm right here. I, I haven't gone anywhere. I haven't left. I've told you to go into this place. You're going to be okay. 
But it can be easy when we're in this, uh, span, pl- this place of hopelessness to look and go, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I don't know how I'm going to conquer this thing. And I don't know how I'm going to get out of this place. You're only going to be able to do it if you know that God is there with you. Because He is. Over the next few weeks, and I'm going to let you know ahead of time, hopefully this doesn't deter you, uh, but over the next few weeks, this is what we're going to look at as far as overcoming hopelessness. We're going to look at next week how God's past dealings with us help provide us hope for the future and for the present of what God's going to do then. Uh, A couple weeks after that, we're going to look at God's provisions in our life, what He gives to us so that we can overcome those things and move from hopelessness to being hope-filled. And then last, we're going to look at the people that God surrounds us with, all through the book of Joshua, to watch Israel go from hopeless to hope-filled and see how we can do the same. But none of this matters. We cannot overcome hopelessness by following some step-by-step program or any of that. None of it works if we do not realize and embrace God's presence in our lives. We have to remember that God is with me. Or we're never going to get out of this place of hopelessness. I want to ask you to do something this week. It's going to sound difficult at first. Uh... I'm going to do it with you. It's something that you can do. Okay, last night, uh, my wife was out to Walmart, and so we ate dinner probably an hour and a half later than normal. My kids thought they were going to die. Uh, It was every five minutes. Dad, my stomach is destroying me. That's what it was every few minutes. And I finally said, son, listen, stop talking to me about the food. We'll eat. You're going to be okay. You're going to live. Here's why I say that. Pick a meal this week to set aside. And instead of eating that meal, some of you may not physically be able to do this. Like, no, I have to eat. All the, I understand. But pick a meal and set that aside. That's what fasting is, by the way. It's not not eating. It's replacing the, the physical food with a, a time of spiritual eating. And if we're going to remember that God is present in our lives, it takes us intentionally thinking about it. And so take one of those meals this week. I'm going to uh, dinner tomorrow night. That's when I'm doing it. So if you're thinking, okay, this is a hard thing for me to do, just remember tomorrow night, Jack's not eating right now. And maybe that'll make you feel bad, and then you'll say, I'm not going to eat in the morning or whatever. But pick a time, and instead of eating during that time, stop to... Read your word. Stop to pray and talk to God. Stop and take a few moments to sing to God. Stop and think about the things that God has put in your life so that you can remember that God is with you. Because if we forget that God is there with us in our lives, if we can't do it when things are going Well, we're certainly not going to do it when things feel hopeless. Israel looked into the promised land 40 years prior to Joshua 1 and said, there's no way we can do this because they forgot that God was with them. 40 years later, talking to Joshua, God says, you need to know, I'm going to be with you the whole time. You've already won. Just trust me, follow me, and love my word. If we're going to overcome our times of hopelessness, we've got to do the same. Set aside that time of eating. Remember that God is with you all the time. It might be this morning that you are sitting here feeling hopeless. Uh, If that's you, please know you have a family of people here that are with you too. Uh, We want to be like Jesus in this place. We want to help other people be like Jesus in this place. And if you're feeling hopeless right now, we want to help you overcome that. Whether uh, it's by you coming forward while we're singing uh, during that time, uh, come and tell us that so we can pray for you. If it's afterwards, come and grab one of us in the back and say, "I I need somebody to pray with me. I'm going through a lot. God's with you. We want to help you see that. 
And we want to help you through those times of hopelessness because it is God's desire that we don't live in hopelessness, but that we become hope-filled.